And in order to reach the space station, we will work with a growing array of private companies competing to make getting to space easier and more affordable. This is based on a decision that was made six years ago, not six months ago. NASA, the organization that pioneered space flight, is now hitching a ride from Richard Branson. Branson's private space flight company, Virgin Galactic, put the space agency on its client list this week. Here's WBBH with the details. NASA just booked its first flight on a private space line, announcing a deal with Virgin Galactic. It is the first flight, and if it's successful, oh. there will be two options for more. The deal is worth an estimated $4.5 million. The flights will transport up to 1,300 pounds of scientific equipment from Virgin Spaceport in New Mexico. In Virgin Galactic flights, passengers will load onto a smaller, rocket-equipped plane, which will itself be carried to 50,000 feet by a larger craft. Then it will disengage, angle upward, and blast off. The trip will give passengers a view of the curvature of the Earth and several minutes of weightlessness. Germany's defunct Rosette satellite is expected to plunge to Earth sometime between Friday and October 24th. German space officials say that the exact fall site is still a mystery. The latest falling satellite comes only a month after a dead NASA satellite called the Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite, or UARS, plunged into the Pacific Ocean in late September. Space is slowly filling up with junk. As demonstrated on February the 10th, when a defunct Soviet-era Russian spacecraft collided with an American communication satellite, orbiting debris is becoming an increasing problem for spacecraft operators. For these reasons, the European Space Agency has a team at its operations center in Darmstadt, Germany, dedicated to monitoring debris and giving advance warning for operational ESA satellites. ESA is also a founding member of the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, which brings together 11 space agencies from around the world to tackle the problem of space debris. The committee's goal is to take active measures to preserve the space environment for future users. Currently, people concentrate on reducing uh, the growth rate of the current space debris population. And this is best done, first of all, by not launching as many objects into space, particularly the ones which are not useful, that is mission-related objects. A second possibility is what's called uh, space debris remediation, that is uh, really curing the problem. And that is done by taking mass from orbit. And this you do by, at the end of the mission, deorbiting your satellite, and deorbiting your satellite, and deorbiting your satellite which will then most likely burn up in the atmosphere. Currently, people concentrate on reducing uh, the growth rate of the current space debris population. At the end of the mission, deorbiting your satellite. That is exactly why it's so essential that we pursue a new course and that we revitalize NASA and its mission. Germany's defunct Rosette satellite is expected to plunge to Earth sometime between Friday and October 24th. At the end of the mission, deorbiting your satellite. Work with a growing array of private companies competing to make getting to space easier and more affordable. To make getting to space easier. I'm Hari Srinivas, and this is The Rundown. In late October, a decommissioned German satellite plunged to Earth somewhere over parts of Southeast Asia. In September, an old NASA satellite fell back to Earth as well. They're reminders of the amount of junk that's floating around our planet. Keep in mind that this junk spins around the Earth pretty fast, around six miles a second. So it poses a very significant threat to astronauts and any future space travel, not to mention the satellites we already have up there. So today, we're talking space junk. And we're joined by one of the most qualified people on the planet to talk about it, Donald Kessler. He was the chair of the National Research Council's latest report on space debris. He's an astrophysicist, a former NASA scientist, and he even has a syndrome named after him. We'll get to that in a minute, but thanks for being with us. Thank you. So how much space junk is out there? I mean, we launched a satellite the first time was, what, 54 years ago or so? Right, and since that time, we've got about 16,000 objects that are maintained by the United States Air Force, but those are just the tip of the iceberg. There are more than 500,000 uh, size objects the size of a centimeter. So a centimeter's worth is half a million and 16,000, what, maybe baseball-sized chunks? Ba yes, exactly. And so a baseball-sized chunk moving at six miles a second does what to a satellite or a spaceship? Well, it, it has the potential of totally catastrophically breaking it up, uh, causing a similar type of event as when the two 
uh, satellites collided, uh, the Iridium and Cosmos satellite back in uh, 2009. I can remember from sci-fi movies, kind of an asteroid belt around different planets. You're, you're almost describing a, a garbage belt around the Earth. That's exactly right. Okay, now we're getting to the interesting thing, why your name is associated with a syndrome. Uh, what happens when these objects collide and what's the risk there? Well, they end up producing an awful lot of small fragments. Um, the, and those fragments then, the larger of those large fragments, then go on to hit something else and cause it to break up and you get a, essentially a chain reaction of events where the, uh, you get an increasing frequency of things breaking up as a result of collisions. So it's kind of like a billiards table or a, 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 a pool hall where one ball hits five and then now those five are moving and they also hit other balls. And Well, it's so, sort of like that except the billiard balls break up and you hit one and you break it up into a hundred others. Each one of those hundred can break up another object. And so what are the risks of this stuff falling back to earth and hitting someone? Uh, everything that's oh, roughly about a, a 600 miles uh, and lower will come in within the next hundred years or so. And of course the lower it is, the more likely it is to come in in a much shorter period of time. And, and, uh, and all of those things are at, you're at risk of them coming in. That's the bad news, but the good news is that, that the risk of any one of them causing any significant damage is pretty small. As far as the individual is concerned, you're really talking about one chances in tens of trillions as far as any particular person being injured. So the big risk is if we launch another rocket, another satellite, or possibly space tourists go up there, as soon as they kind of pop their head up out of the atmosphere, there's a chance that they could get a bigger than a ding in their windshield. That's exactly right. In fact, the astronauts do take precautions, uh, try not to stay out very long. They, when the space telescope was repaired, for example, they positioned the shuttle in their own working position such that they would be shielded from the direction that most of the debris is coming from. Uh, it is a risk that astronauts take, but in space, every 90 minutes, something comes around again and gets another chance to hit you. All right, so my, my final question is kind of an uh, odd one, but what do we do about it? It's not like we can send a garbage truck up there and just to, you know, have a huge net and catch all this stuff. That is what uh, is worrying NASA today, and that because we've reached this point where uh, there's enough stuff in orbit that it will collide with one another. It will become the dominant source of debris in the future. And the only way you can reverse this process is to essentially bring down some of the larger stuff, the more massive stuff that's most likely to contribute debris. Essentially bring down some of the larger stuff, the more massive stuff that's most likely to contribute debris. At the end of the mission, deorbiting a satellite. And that means uh, one study that, that has been done says if we retrieve about five objects per year, and they have to be a select number of five objects, the ones that are most likely to break up and cause debris, and we do that for the next hundred years, then we can stabilize the low Earth orbit environment. Unfortunately, we don't know how to do that. It's a football field sized balloon made of gossamer thin but super tough material, kind of like solar sails, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, it'll be flown into orbit deflated in a suitcase sized box that you kind of see on the left hand side there. This and is a brilliant idea, by the way. This makes so much you sense. It's not the, even funny. You attach the suitcase to the space jump that you want to pull down. Yep. You inflate the balloon, essentially. Yep. It creates, a, it creates more drag. Yep. You know, so it's, there's more mass for it to start pulling down. It slows down and gets sucked into our atmosphere and pulled back down into Earth. And then burnt and in then our burnt. atmosphere. Hello, everybody. This is Sheila Aliens, and today is October 28th, 2011. So what I'm trying to say by all of that is, what if NASA has been purposefully deorbiting large defunct satellites and other space debris and just playing dumb about it. The incentive for them to do this would be the fact that a lot of the people at NASA are going to be out of jobs if they don't go to these privatized companies for commercial spaceflight projects. So that's where they're all going to be going and in order to carry on those projects. A lot of that space jump has to go, and they're probably bringing them down on purpose.
to make room for new things. And this is just another side note. I don't know if it really has anything to do with anything, but also consider that maybe Comet Elenin was a distraction, a decoy for us conspiracy folks, and it worked really good. Somebody just pulled Elenin out of their ass December of 2010, and there's been so much conspiracy talk about that object in less than a year. It feels like it's been three years on the Elenin thing. You know it. So, that was definitely perpetuated by NASA. And they timed the Elenin thing at the same time that they knew that they were going to be deorbiting these satellites, which also fits in neatly with the meteor shower of the fall. So they just kind of covered their asses all the way around, maybe. Maybe. Just a thought. So that guy lied. They do have technology to bring it down. That's just one way. I'm sure they have other ways to do that. There's something called an ion beam shepherd which has been tested and proven to work, which is just that. It's an ion beam laser in outer space that they use to round up and move space junk to wherever they want it to fall. And then they are lying or not telling us that they're downing these satellites because they could possibly hit somebody and they don't want to be responsible for it evidence of this would be all the strange fireballs that people have been seeing falling from the sky this year. And that is what you're looking at. These are fireballs captured from various meteor observation networks around the world this year. Which could mean anything. It's just that. It's a fireball. It could be space junk. It could be a UFO. It could be most likely and most commonly a meteor burning up in the atmosphere, but they also can capture anything that's in the sky and moving. So that's just my crazy theory. I had been working on that for a few weeks now. Then this video that was just uploaded by PBS yesterday, really, I guess that's what I needed in order to finish this because it's been a project I've been working on. And that just really tied it all together for me. Catastrophically breaking it up, uh, causing a similar type of event as when the two uh, satellites collided, uh, the Iridium and Cosmos satellite, back in uh, 2009. All right, so my, my final question is kind of an uh, odd one, but what do we do about it? It's not like we can send a garbage truck up there and just to, you know, have a huge net and catch all this stuff. That is what... Uh, is worrying NASA today and that because we've reached this point where uh, there's enough stuff in orbit that it will collide with one another it will become the dominant source of debris in the future and the only way you can reverse this process is to essentially bring down some of the larger stuff the more massive stuff that's most likely to contribute debris and that means uh, one study that that has been done says if we retrieve about five objects per year and they have to be a select number of five objects the ones that are most likely to break up and cause debris and we do that for the next hundred years then we can stabilize the low earth orbit environment unfortunately we don't know how to do that uh, at least we don't have the tools the operational tools to do that all right don kessler thanks so much for your time thank you this is the rundown i'm harry srinivasan stay with us If it's true, then it makes sense. Again, this is just my theory. I wanted to share it with you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Much love. Yeah.